All right. Well, today we have a uh, we have a daunting task in front of us, and that is to uh, to look at Christianity in modern Europe. And uh, as we do so, you understand really uh, this lecture is no different from any other. Uh, there's not enough time to cover the, the the vast subject that is in front of us. But I'm going to just kind of touch on some different. Uh, individuals and movements uh, in, uh, in European Christianity uh, in the last uh, couple of centuries. And if there's uh, anything there that, that, uh, that piques your curiosity and your interest, well, there are, you, you will have opportunities uh, elsewhere to, uh, to study more and to learn more about, uh, about this period of time. The, uh, as we discuss, at the, at the very beginning, historians divide up uh, the, uh, the, the history of the church in various eras. And even within the larger uh, eras, there are further divisions. When we look at the early church, we look at uh, the church before and after the Council of Nicaea the anti-Nicene church and the post-Nicene church. Uh, then we move into the medieval period, and we look at the uh, early medieval, uh, the, uh, uh, the middle medieval, and then the, the high medieval ages. Then we move into the period of the, the Reformation. And following the Reformation, then, uh, it really gets very difficult to, uh, to very neatly outline history, because after the Reformation, we have multiple streams of Christianity, and we look at uh, the different denominations, uh, we look at uh, Christianity in Europe and in America, and, and even, of course, we really just touch on global Christianity in this survey because we're so limited in the amount of time that we have, uh, but nonetheless, uh, global Christianity is also uh, part, of our, part of our scope. But the modern period uh, begins really right now, right at this point, 1789, is considered the, uh, the beginning of the, uh, the modern uh, era. And the, uh, the background is of, uh, French rationalism that, uh, uh, and the, um, the influence of the Age of Enlightenment and the uh, philosophical streams that developed uh, in the Age of Enlightenment and how that affected uh, France uh, not only philosophically but also socially and politically. The leaders, uh, the, the, the philosophical leaders of, uh, of the French rationalism were Voltaire, Montesquieu, and Rousseau. Uh, Voltaire, actually his <laughs> His political views were so radical that he ended up uh, imprisoned in Bastille, and then he was exiled. But his, and of course you can understand why he would have been imprisoned, uh, because his teaching about the monarchy, that it was uh, not intended for the benefit of the sovereign, but for the benefit of the subjects whose rights he must respect and defend. Well, the uh, French monarch felt no uh, inclination toward respecting the rights of his subjects, certainly not the rights of Voltaire, so, uh, so Voltaire was uh, imprisoned and then uh, exiled. But nonetheless, his ideas about the monarchy uh, had uh, an influence on France. So then we have uh, Montesquieu. Uh, we actually study Montesquieu in uh, American history because of his influence on uh, political thought uh, in America, teaching that a republic is better government than despotism, ruling by terror, or the monarchy, ruling by uh, the, the honor of the monarchy. And so he taught that the government should be exercised by three powers, legislative, executive, and judicial. So that his influence is obvious on, uh, on American government. And then Jean-Jacques Rousseau was, uh, was mentioned in our discussion of uh, uh, the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, he was one of the romantics, uh, philosophical romanticism, and he had a very high view of humanity, and he was opposed to the divine right of kings, saying neither law nor government is appointed by God. Both 
are based on the general will of the governed. And he uh, used the term social contract to talk about the relationship between uh, the individual and government. And so he paved the way for the American and French revolutions. Well, the French Revolution uh, began July 14th uh, in 1789 with the storming of the Bastille, culminated in 1792 with the uh, execution of Louis XVI. Um, I would uh, just like to mention some uh, uh, books and or movies for your consideration. If you are on Netflix and you're wanting to add something to your queue, well, uh, uh, here's some ideas. Uh, Scaramouche, uh, S-C-R-A-M-O-U-C-H-E, Scaramouche is a swashbuckler uh, with uh, Stuart Granger uh, and a couple of leading ladies, but uh, it was uh, taken, uh, it, was, it set just ahead of uh, the French Revolution. Uh, so it's a fun uh, it's a fun uh, movie. And then uh, Tale of Two Cities, of course, uh, the, the great novel by Charles Dickens. And Charles Dickens is mm, pretty dense to wade through, I will confess, but uh, I do remember that, that Tale of Two Cities was worth it when you get to the end, and my word, he brings together some diverse uh, plot uh, threads and just weaves them together in a way that just made my jaw drop. How many of y'all have read Taylor Two Cities? Does, does the uh, opening lines count? I can't uh, yeah. <laughs> The opening lines, which are, Lawrence? Uh, do the best of the time, do the worst of time. That's all I got. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yes, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. All right. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of different movies uh, based on Taylor Two Cities. One was, uh, the one, one of the recent ones that I recommend is actually made for TV with, um, Chris uh, Sarazan as uh, as the as the, the dual roles of um, uh, Sidney Carton and, and Charles uh, Darnay uh, and Alice Krieger uh, as the uh, as Lucy Manette. Oh, uh, very uh, good good role. Well, anyway, uh, then the the other one is Scarlet Pimpernel. Awesome story, Scarlet Pimpernel. Uh, I tell you what, uh, there's this is one of the most romantic movies I've ever seen. And guys, there's some great lines that you need to uh, copy out <laughs> and learn uh, and uh, and use. The uh, again, it's interesting that uh, I think the, the, the there's a, an old black and white um, with Leslie Howard um, in the title role, uh, but uh, uh, 1984, made for TV with Anthony Andrews and Jane Seymour. Gorgeous, really and truly. I think she's in the top ten of uh, beautiful actresses. Uh, and this is, this is a terrific role. Scarlet Pimpernel, 1984, made for TV. Uh, it's available on DVD. So that's my, uh, that's my movie review uh, for today. Well, uh, when we, when we uh, uh, talk about the French Revolution, uh, we, uh, we want to uh, take advantage of uh, of an expert in our midst. And uh, Colby Lambert uh, did his uh, a research paper on, uh, on the French Revolution. I've asked him to take about uh, 10 minutes or so uh, just, to, uh, uh, just to share with us uh, what he learned uh, in his research. So, Colby, please talk to us about the French Revolution. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty interested in the French Revolution because I'm an American patriot all the way and I love the American Revolution and to me the French Revolution stands in big contrast to the American Revolution and what I discovered in researching was the French Revolution began mostly because of socio-economic downfall. Um, France had really built <laughs> us out and our revolution kind of broke them and so they came back, the king was broke, uh, you know, the class warfare was going on. A lot of peasants felt the oppression of the, uh, of the rich and uh, also the Catholic Church. At that point, almost every single French person had been, was a part of the Catholic Church, which is ironic seeing as, you know, Calvin was from France and the, the Protestant Reformation had really happened in France, a lot of it. And so 
the picture of France right before the Revolution was people were feeling very oppressed by authority, and the Catholic Church was a major part of that. And when the Revolution broke out in July 14th, and a third estate came around, um, they immediately attacked the Catholic Church. They immediately tried to undermine the authority of the Church. And a lot of people see that as just taking away the authority that was over them, but um, they took away the power to tithe. The tithe was now part of the government's role. So they chose how much money they would receive, the government would, and they took that power away from the church. And they also would do things like melt down things in the church to make cannonballs. They would, it just it went from there. So the beginning of the French Revolution was really an attack on the Catholic Church. And by 1792, um, we saw the reign of terror, and the reign of terror was pretty much, if you don't agree exactly with what we say, we're going to cut your head off. So, it, you know, Louis, Louis the, um, 15th or 16th was beheaded, and I think when I, I like 50,000 priests in a matter of two years were executed, 50,000. And so it was an all-out war on the Catholic Church, and from the reign of terror, um, not only were priests killed, but Baptists, any other denomination that was around was was um, antagonized, and what I saw from the when I studied the French Revolution is it was enlightenment thought manifested. It was enlightenment thought of man is much better than religion. Man is smarter; he can figure things out. And you really saw this birth of deism in the government. Um, Voltaire, Rousseau, all of them liked the idea <laughs> of deism, and they had this cult of the supreme being that Rousseau really started. And it was just this deist guy that you just kind of, you liked and you had festivals for, but there was no absolute authority. There was no authority, a divine authority, telling you how to live your life. So you have the French Revolution embodying enlightenment, enlightenment thought, attacking the church. And it would go on to execute so many priests, um, exile them, arrest them. And uh, really, by the end of it, it had started Europe's mentality against religion, that by the end of the French Revolution, that revolution set the mindset for what we see in Europe now. We see the mindset of evolution, atheism, all those things can be traced to this kind of mindset that we are so against an authoritative religion that we are willing to execute them for it. And so what I discovered is the French Revolution set the bar for what Europe is now. And when you look at that against the American Revolution, you had, I mean, the revolutions happened within two decades, decades of each other. Um, a revolution sparked for religious freedom, and we know that some colonies didn't have religious freedom, but you saw an entire revolution spark by the fact that authority was forcing something on you, and you escaped that, and you want liberty, and you want freedom, and then the exact opposite is you see an authoritative government telling you, you're going to believe this, or we're going to execute you. And so what I found was um, the French Revolution, when I was in school, I went to Southern Miss for two and a half years, and it's a secular university. That the French Revolution was prized above all revolutions. It was the number one. It was the one that you studied the most. And you see things like Les Mis, which is a movie coming out pretty soon, which is based off the musical, based off the book. And it pretty much glorifies the French Revolution. And also there's a Coldplay song, Viva La Vida, which glorifies the French Revolution, but when I just, when I looked at it, it is it is unrestrained, depraved humanity attacking authority. Um, and even and I'm not saying the church, the Catholic Church, was not in the wrong. It, I mean, it wasn't a lot of things, but you see Enlightenment thought unhinged and letting man kill and decide who his authority is going to be and who he wants his authority to be, which is itself. Okay. Right. Well, thank you, Colby. And I think that's uh, it's a uh, it's an important comparison between the the French Revolution and the American Revolution. And I have uh, uh, be, because the one of the uh, reasons for the settlement in America <coughs> was for religious freedom. Now, granted, uh, the uh, the Congregationalists that established the, the Congregationalist Church in New England. They were wanting religious freedom for themselves and denied it to others. Uh, but uh, when you look at, uh, the, at a, the American colonies as a whole, we see uh, beginnings of religious freedom uh, in, in many different, different colonies. And, and ultimately, 
that was the goal of uh, the, the American Constitution, was, uh, was religious liberty. Um, and uh, I think that another, uh, another uh, point to remember is that immediately preceding the American Revolution was the great uh, religious movement, the Great Awakening. Okay, which, which impacted all 13 colonies. And so we, we have uh, this, this great spiritual revival in America, and, uh, and many historians look back at that time period and say that the, the, the Great Awakening also uh, uh, made the American Revolution a much more positive uh, movement in terms of uh, uh, religious freedom and, uh, and, and social development. Jeff? You say many historians. Does that include the secular historians as well? As Probably not. <laughs> yes, I, I think that, that uh, at, least, uh, at least contemporary secular historians, uh, as, they, as, as they study uh, American history, probably are going to um, uh, ignore the Great Awakening, um, religious liberty, uh, the influence of Baptists. They're going to ignore it as much as they can. Uh, I mean, it's hard to write about uh, American history without um, um, bringing up the, the influence of religion and especially Christianity, uh, but as much as is possible, uh, they do so. Uh, Joey? I was just going to say, take all the American histories at LSU, and we didn't learn anything about anything related to awakening, nothing. It was, right. It sums it didn't happen. Right. So, where is the responsibility for teaching uh, the role of Christianity in American history. Where does that fall? It falls on the church. All right. It falls on you men in this room. Okay. And I'm I'm laying a charge upon you that when you uh, are 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 ministering in your circle of, of of ministry, you must teach church history. You must. Uh, you must teach theology. Uh, you must teach these subjects that are not being taught in our schools. And so uh, the only way that you're going to get it out to your people is to teach it. Okay? Uh, that's, that's, why, that's why I'm teaching you all church history. Uh, it's not just so that, you, you know, it's, it's not for, you're, you're not the end goal. The end goal is is the churches. So I hope that you'll take take on that responsibility and, and, and teach it. I heard uh, I heard from uh, one of my online students uh, today. Uh, he uh, said that uh, he he did his paper on the uh, the history of the English Bible, and he was talking about it to his uh, uh, members of his of his church, and they were excited and wanted to hear about it. And so he was telling me that he's going to uh, uh, to, to to teach a class. And I said. You're going to find that your people are very interested, and you're going to find that, that you're going to think about other topics that you can teach. Um, of course, as, as you know, uh, this is the first uh, semester that I've, I've offered the, you know, the option of doing a PowerPoint lecture you know, that is taught in class, and I'm, I'm already hearing some good reports about that. So anyway, all this to say that, that let's, let's, let's teach the history of Christianity uh, in, our, in our churches. Okay. Well, um, uh, Colby has uh, has uh, done uh, has done much of my job uh, here in terms of uh, talking about the French Revolution, uh, and uh, and in fact, it really has uh, influenced not only France but uh, all of Europe. Uh, France has essentially become a, um, a a pagan nation. It's a it's a uh, it's fiercely secular. Uh, some of you may know Bob and Linda Jackson. Uh, Linda runs the uh, Providence Guest House, and, and Bob uh, uh, also uh, uh, functions as part of the staff of New Orleans Seminary. I first met Bob and Linda in Tunisia, where they had served as missionaries for five years. And previously, they had served five years in France. And, uh, and Linda said that the five years in Tunisia, in a Muslim nation, uh, they had uh, uh, a more successful and fruitful work in Tunisia than they did in France. They 
that, that working in France was very, very difficult because of the secular nature of, uh, of the nation. Yes, Colby? I was uh, speaking to a pastor who <coughs> some missionaries in France, and he said they're, because of their, so high, their, their view of humanity is so high, you have to do the gospel backwards. Instead of saying, you're sinful, therefore you need a savior, you just have to start with God being awesome, and then work your way down into the depravity of man. So they have to, they have to become okay with the idea of God first before you even start talking about, hey, you're messed up, because that just doesn't compute because of enlightenment thought. Right. Okay. Very good. Yes, and we're going to see as we, as we move into uh, the um, uh, liberal Christianity, or you know, Christian liberalism of Europe, we're going to see this very elevated view of uh, humanity. Well, let's uh, let's jump uh, let's jump ahead to uh, to uh, Hegel. I've told you before that uh, philosophy is uh, my weakness. Uh, I may have told you my definition of a philosopher. A philosopher is someone with entirely too much time on his hands. <laughs> Otherwise, who could possibly uh, sit around and think, oh? There is uh, there's another universe that exists uh, above and before uh, the universe that we see, and uh, and there we have all of the ideals of what exists here. So that when I see this table, it is not really a table; it is simply the uh, a, a representation of tableness from uh, from the from the the ultimate universe. You know what I'm saying? Plato and his his shadows. I'm sorry. Who on earth? would think that. I'm so glad that we have television to distract people from, uh, <laughs> from, uh, from, from uh, philosophizing. But uh, <laughs> Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel uh, was a Christian. Uh, he did not deny the deity of Christ uh, or resurrection, although his uh, religion uh, you know, borders on uh, pantheism. Uh, the the real contribution that Hegel uh, made to philosophy was his, his dialectic, this <laughs> three-stage process that forms the basis of Hegelian dialectic logic. And you've seen this kind of, uh, of, of logic elsewhere. Uh, the thesis is opposed by the antithesis, which is reconciled in the synthesis, which then becomes a new thesis. All right. Um, I, uh, I tried to find some uh, e examples. Uh, these are some that I came up with. All right, uh, man cannot fly. That's a thesis. The antithesis is that man wants to fly. The synthesis is that uh, uh, man creates a flying machine. All right. So, so one idea is opposed by another, and then that brings out a synthesis. All right. Another uh, suggestion was. Cars run on gas. Uh, we're running out of petroleum resources. That's the antithesis. And so the synthesis is we need to create alternative energy sources. Uh, have you noticed how alternative energy sources are now the the uh, the, the the topic of of of, uh, of movies? Uh, I was watching Spider-Man Two the other night with Doctor Octopus, and he, I mean, his whole thing was he was creating an alternative energy. Um, uh, the Avengers movie, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Tesseract. Yeah, it was supposed to be an alternative energy source. All right, so alternative energy is, is, uh, is the whatever, is the, the new synthesis. All right, um, so, but the, the, these are just a couple of, uh, of examples from, uh, from a, a, a scientific uh, approach of, of problem solving, but uh, the Hegelian uh, dialectic was applied to a number of, of places. Uh, we'll find uh, uh, socialism and also in, uh, in religion and, and in history. There's a, so we're going to see this Hegelian uh, dialectic uh, later on today. Uh, and so uh, Hegel maintained that this process continues as history unfolds and progresses until society reaches the absolute idea 
the ultimate synthesis so perfect that there's no need for any antithesis. All right, so this is Hegel's idea that, uh, that uh, history is moving through uh, this uh, threefold process up to uh, absolute, the absolute idea. All right, um, now during this period of time, there are three intellectual developments that have uh, serious ramifications on all of culture and especially on our subject, which is uh, the history of Christianity. We have Charles Darwin uh, positing his uh, theory of evolution, uh, Karl Marx uh, promoting communism, and Sigmund Freud uh, developing uh, psychoanalysis. Well, you, you know who Charles Darwin uh, was, an English naturalist. He formulated the theory of evolution uh, during an expedition to South America. And his two uh, best-known works are The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, 1859, and then The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, 1871. It always surprises me. I don't know why, but it always surprises me to see how early on uh, these books were, uh, were, were published uh, and how, uh, and, and of course we know what an impact uh, they have made. Of course the illustration there, of, you know, illustrates the reaction, the initial reaction against Darwin was that it was uh, preposterous that we would uh, come from AIDS. But uh, nonetheless, uh, his theory of evolution um, advanced rapidly throughout the uh, scientific world, uh, education, government, uh, and, and the ideas behind evolution are also going to have an impact on uh, some understanding of religion, that religion also has been uh, evolving. And of course, uh, the word uh, evolving has been used in relationship to our attitude toward homosexuality, for example, because someone's uh, thought has evolved. The idea being that it has improved. Evolution uh, having this idea of improvement as, uh, as it goes forward, all right? Um, well, let's, uh, we're going to talk a great deal about the impact of Darwin and evolution on American Christianity next week when we talk about the Scopes Monkey Trial. In fact, uh, we'll look at a uh, we'll look at a, a, a film clip from uh, the movie Inherit the Wind next week to talk more about the impact of uh, the theory of evolution on uh, Christianity. <coughs> so let's uh, go ahead and talk about uh, Karl Marx. Uh, his parents were Jews. They converted to Lutheranism. Uh, Karl Marx became a journalist and then uh, began to uh, uh, theorize on uh, politics, wrote the Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital. Uh, and what we have here is a Hegelian approach to economics, sociology, and politics. We have a, a, a picture of history that is evolving in stages. The character of each era is determined by economic features rather than ideas. And uh, he applies the Hegelian uh, logic to his understanding of history, uh, showing that in each stage, conflict emerges between the status quo and its opposition, producing a new stage or a new status quo. Now, I don't think that this is in your notes. I think that I added it uh, just uh, today. I've always uh, mentioned it uh, in class, but I, I decided I'd go ahead and put it up in front of you so you can see how uh, Karl Marx worked this out in his view of economic history. And uh, just picking it up with the period of feudalism, and again, uh, uh, if, you, if you haven't had history of Christianity early to medieval, you may not, you, you may not have a firm grasp on on feudalism, but it is a land-owning aristocracy. Feudalism is an economy based on uh, one's land. Uh, and that land uh, provides wealth because of its uh, 
because of agriculture and uh, uh, livestock and human resources that come with that land. Uh, whoever owns that land has that wealth. And uh, uh, theoretically, the king owns all of the land of his kingdom, and he parcels it out to nobles who owe him allegiance. And then those nobles then par parcel out their land to knights who in turn owe them their allegiance. And so uh, the, the, the wealth comes from the land because of uh, not only its economic benefits but also the human resources that one can call upon to uh, create armies. All right, so, so feudalism is a land-owning aristocracy. That's the status quo. But then we have the opposition comes when we have the development of the bourgeoisie, the urban middle class. This took place following the Crusades when uh, trade routes uh, opened up so that all of a sudden trading merchants have a way of obtaining wealth outside of owning land. The banking industry develops. Uh, the, uh, the Knights Templar, if you haven't if you haven't had early to medieval, well, please uh, join me next semester. We'll talk about the Knights Templar and the beginning of the banking industry. Uh, it was uh, if you have if your if your wealth is based on land, and you travel from Europe to the Middle East, how are you going to carry your wealth with you? Well, you're going to go to the Knights Templar in Europe, and you're going to get a letter of credit and you're going to carry that letter to the Middle East where there are more Knights Templar. They're going to give you uh, the gold represented by this letter of credit with some interest uh, uh, in, involved. And so, uh, and so that's how the banking industry began. And so banking then becomes a way of developing wealth outside of land. So we have the bourgeoisie. After that then, the, uh, uh, that's the, the, uh, the thesis the antithesis and the synthesis is capitalism. Capitalism, which is not a land-based uh, uh, economy. It is an economy based on money. And then we have uh, capitalism and the Industrial Revolution then create a new thesis. Uh, the opposition is the proletariat, who are oppressed and rebellious, and the synthesis, uh, and yes, and the synthesis then is socialism, where human needs are considered above profit. And then the next thesis is communism, a social system that meets everyone's need, according to <coughs> Karl Marx. Okay, so this is uh, this is the development of uh, communism, <coughs> and the um, according to Karl Marx the communist utopia has a goal to produce a classless society without any exploitation of class warfare. Each person will produce according to his ability, consume according to his need. But uh, how this impacts uh, religion is that it was a very atheistic uh, economic philosophy. Uh, Marx viewed religion as an opiate of the people, as, uh, as we have heard, a means whereby the church in league with the state kept the working class desensitized to its plight in hopes of future life that will not occur. Thus dulled, the masses can be exploited. It is for this reason that, uh, that uh, classic uh, communism is an atheistic uh, society because, uh, because religion then um, is, uh, is used against the people. All right? Now we have seen that um, this does not work of course, we've seen the fall of, of communism in the uh, USSR. Communism is still uh, active in, uh, in China, but I will say that uh, China has made room for religion in its society. And I have uh, attended large churches in China, a number of churches. Uh, one has a thousand every week. That's the smallest one that I, that I saw. Others have 4,000 every week. One has 10,000 every week. This one in, uh, in Beijing has multiple services, Sunday night, uh, Saturday night and Sunday morning. And uh, they, uh, uh, 
when you go outside, they actually have speakers set up in the parking lot, and the music and the sermons are broadcast to the neighborhood. So that's kind of amazing but that, that China has made room for uh, religion in its, in, its, um, in its society. Now, these are regulated churches. There are unregulated churches, uh, many times called underground churches, and uh, they, they are even more prolific uh, in communist China. But they're working outside of the system. Yes, Jerry? So what's the catch with the regulated churches? Okay. Uh, there, there's really a number of catches. <clears throat> One is that uh, they fall under the, uh, the jurisdiction of uh, the provincial governor. And that governor can determine how many churches are in his province. I think one reason why these churches have, have, have such high attendance numbers is that there are so few churches that are allowed. The, 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 the governor may say, well, we have, enough, we, have a, we have a church in this province. That's all we need. Well, it, it isn't all that, that's needed for the number of, of, of people that are interested in Christianity, that are converting to Christianity, that are coming to these churches. That's why they have multiple services that are so large. So that's one, that's one catch. Uh, the, um, um, the, the Chinese Christian Council, CCC, uh, determines uh, who, will be, who will be the pastor of the church. So they, they decide the pastor of the church. Um, and uh, then they, they do they <coughs> monitor the, uh, uh, the sermons. But the sermons are not monitored uh, to, um, to suppress the gospel. They're monitored to suppress, suppress any uh, possible sedition. So, uh, now my sister uh, served in China for 19 years, and she worked exclusively with the uh, registered churches. And uh, uh, she tells me that, that, you know, she goes, she can hear, she understands, and she says the gospel is being preached. And uh, people are coming to Christ, oh my word, uh, hundreds and thousands in the registered churches. I was at a church uh, one time where there were 27 that were being baptized uh, that, uh, that day. Um, these were all adults. They do not baptize infants. Now, baptism was by sprinkling. That grieved me. <laughs> but uh, they were they were uh, they were baptized as adult believers. They did not baptize infants, so that was encouraging. Uh, there were two pastors at the church. They were both women. Now uh, that um, you know kind of took me aback, but I, I was not overwhelmingly dismayed. It was just uh, that is uh, um, that is part of their their culture. So uh, so that was I I was there in 2006, and again in 2011. I'm going uh, a year from now, uh, and actually a year from now, I'll be, I'll be uh, teaching pastors of unregistered churches. So I'll be getting a totally different picture of Christianity in China a year from now when I go uh, uh, to teach. So I'll be teaching uh, about Chinese Christianity in a different way after that. But anyway, this is what I know, okay? So uh, again, back to Karl Marx, uh, certainly uh, had an impact on uh, religion in communist countries. And of course, I'm, I'm describing China now. China under Mao Zedong was a, was a, a very oppressive uh, regime. And uh, all Christians were martyred uh, by the, the thousands, the hundreds of thousands. Who knows how many were martyred. But do you know what? I, I, I read a book. And if you're interested in um, martyrdom in the contemporary world, uh, a book, the title is Faith That Endures. Faith That Endures is written by a man named Ronald Boyd McMillan, hyphenated last name, Boyd McMillan. Faith That Endures. But uh, the author talks about visiting some Christians in China, and uh, they, uh, they opened up their meeting with a toast to the man who did more than anyone else to, uh, to spread Christianity in China. And he was, he was, the, the author was interested to hear who was this, this great preacher, this great evangelist, uh, that uh, that had uh, done so much to advance Christianity, and they said to Mao Zedong, whose uh, whose uh, persecution uh, 
really brought, uh, brought about an opportunity of revival. What's happened in, in China is that in centuries past, there have been many different uh, Christian groups come to, uh, to evangelize China, to bring the, 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 the gospel to China, going back all the way to Nestorian Christians uh, in, uh, in the 7th century, uh, and then the, uh, the Jesuits in the 16th century, and then later on, uh, certainly um, uh, evangelical missionaries uh, such as uh, Lottie Moon and uh, uh, Hudson Taylor, uh, Bill Wallace, but uh, it, was, uh, it was after the, uh, the Communist Revolution when, when, the, when the, uh, the, the uh, foreign missionaries were, were removed. Then Christianity became indigenous. And that has made all the difference in Christianity in China. <coughs> well, we are far afield. Uh, let's, uh, let's look uh, at, uh, just let me just mention uh, Sigmund Freud. We know that uh, uh, he pioneered psycho psychoanalysis. Uh, he taught that religion is an illusion that represents a belief system that just projects one wishes. Uh, and uh, he said that religion had proved valuable as a source of security. It provided ethical standards necessary for civilization, but he felt that modern man has outgrown the usefulness of religion, which Freud place with a rationally based system. All right, religion was a social neurosis uh, used as an escape mechanism. The gods are simply father figures or illusions of, uh, of the child's relationship with a biological father. All right, obviously we uh, uh, do not, uh, we do not uh, agree with, with Freud, uh, quite, quite the opposite, but we, we cannot avoid the fact that he has had a tremendous influence on uh, the world view of religion. And so these three men, um, Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, and Sigmund Freud, had an impact uh, through their intellectual contributions uh, to, uh, to society. They had an impact on religion. Well, religion responded with uh, liberalism. Uh, so that, uh, so that uh, many in the church, whether they were pastors or teachers, felt that they needed to uh, accommodate uh, Christianity to this new world view that was developing uh, in the 19th century. So a definition of theological liberalism is uh, to reinterpret and restate Christianity in terms compatible with modern scientific and philosophical viewpoints. They, uh, a, a, a theological liberal accepts science and reason, but uh, places religious truth in a distinct sphere of understanding. So uh, liberal theologians separate uh, religious truth from science and reason. Here are characteristics of theological liberalism. Truth can be discovered by reason. We do not need uh, uh, supernaturally revealed uh, scripture. Uh, we need reason. They rejected the Bible as religious authority because uh, it is a human book. All right? So we have relativism. There's no absolute truths. Do we see this today? We see this postmodernism, okay? No absolute truths. An emphasis on the present life. This is, uh, this is what is important, uh, how we live now. So it becomes very uh, focused on ethics and uh, moral living and a naive optimism. And what I mean by that is an elevation of the understanding of, of humanity. Humans are basically good. And, uh, and so we're very optimistic about, uh, about humanity. All right, this, uh, oops. <clears throat> this also is, is new, something that I just inserted uh, for, for you today. Adolf Harnack was a liberal, and uh, in his book, What is Christianity?, he comes up with uh, his summary of his understanding 
of Christianity. It is the brotherhood of man. And notice he places that first. The brotherhood of man. The fatherhood of God. No mention of Jesus. God. An emphasis on God. Uh, the father of humanity. The commandment of love. All right, again, the ethics. Love becomes the ultimate ethic, how we treat uh, each other. And then the infinite value of the human soul. All right. So, the brotherhood of man, the fatherhood of God, commandment of love, and infinite value of the human soul. This is one person's uh, very brief way of summarizing uh, his, his understanding of theology. Now, Richard Niebuhr is actually an American. Uh, I insert him here because he, he is addressing liberal, liberal Protestantism, and this is a, a negative assessment of liberal, liberal Protestantism. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. I think that's, that pretty much sums it up of, uh, of what, of what uh, liberalism uh, is. I was listening the other night uh, to... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. He's a professor at Southern Seminary. He's produced a, uh, a, uh, a very succinct uh, DVD series on, on the history of, of Christianity. And I've forgotten what, uh, what he said that I was going to quote. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sure it will come to me in just a minute, and I will tell you what uh, what he said about uh, about uh, about liberal uh, Christianity. <coughs> All right, it's not going to come. Let's uh, let's move on. Let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the, the the man that we consider the father of liberal theology is uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher, and notice that he came out of a Pietist background. Now, you'll remember that when we talked about pietism, that I was just jumping up and down with enthusiasm over pietism as a movement uh, because it was reacting against this cold, uh, hardened, sterile uh, uh, Christianity that uh, had been reduced to just a, a belief system, just a mental assent to uh, uh, creeds uh, and confessions. And instead, pietism talks about part of Christianity and uh, the importance of how one lives out one's faith. However, pietism never did, uh, at its origin, pietism never let go of the importance of uh, true doctrine. That was always very important to uh, the pietists. But uh, they did, um, they, they, I believe that at the beginning, they, they kept it very much in balance of uh, right believing and right living. But as with every movement, when you go to an extreme, you get into error. You get into heresy. And that's what we see with Schleiermacher, because he went so far into the, the idea of, of, of feeling that he began to define religion as feeling, uh, in German, a uh, Gefühl. Uh, Christianity was a, as an individual's personal feeling of absolute dependence upon God, a definition that uh, uh, influenced uh, Protestant liberals. See, he was a contemporary of Hegel. He actually predated Darwin, Marx, and Freud, so we've kind of taken him uh, out of chronological order because we're looking at, at uh, we looked at the intellectuals as a theme, now we're looking at theologians uh, as a theme. But uh, he introduced a classical liberal theology, an emphasis on morality and an optimism about uh, human nature. Okay, he's not dependent upon Jesus Christ. He's dependent upon an internal relationship uh, with God. All right, well, let's... Um, Let's just move on. Uh, you've got uh, several uh, statements about uh, Schleiermacher's 
uh, liberal theology. I want to move on to another important uh, uh, development in theological thought, uh, biblical higher criticism. Uh, this was the idea of, of studying the Bible as a work of literature, uh, looking at the Bible as a, uh, as a very human book written not by the inspiration of God, but written by um, men who were, um, they were uh, religious geniuses. They were certainly, uh, had, a, had a high level of, uh, of religious intellect and insight, but their writings were not uh, inspired. And in fact, uh, they began to uh, uh, kind of dissect the different uh, uh, books of the Bible and find that they were uh, really compilations of, of multiple uh, uh, documentary uh, sources or oral sources pieced together by an editor and changed and redacted over time. Uh, F.C. Bauer uh, was uh, was one of the uh, early uh, critics. <clears throat> he believed that the, the New Testament reflected a, a synthesis of Jewish and Hellenistic traditions. Uh, you can think of this also uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Hegelian uh, dialectic. First we have Jewish Christianity uh, represented by uh, Simon Peter. That's the thesis. That was the original version of Christianity. Jewish Christianity represented by Peter. The antithesis is Hellenistic Christianity represented by Paul. And then we have the synthesis, uh, and that becomes uh, the Catholic Christianity of the second century. So we have Jewish Christianity, uh, thesis, synthesis, Hellenistic Christianity. The thesis then becomes Catholic Christianity. He essentially denied Pauline authorship of, of all the books except for Romans, Galatians, and 1st and 2nd Corinthians because uh, the other books did not exhibit anti-Jewish uh, tendencies. Therefore, they must not have been written by Paul because Paul's, uh, Paul was antithetical to Jewish Christianity and all of his <coughs> true writings would have exhibit, exhibited these anti-Judaizing tendencies. So that was his his way of uh, his way of criticizing uh, the Bible. He said the Gospels are not historically reliable. The Gospel of John is historically worthless. So we begin to uh, to start uh, uh, eliminating uh, books of uh, the Scripture. Why would he not try to read John to the Pauline style of theology? I guess because it is of the Gospels the most anti-Jewish. You want to call it that, but it seems to still be. If in defining Jewish, or Paul just by his Jewish tendencies, that seems kind of like, I don't know, yeah, just like, because Paul was raised a Jewish person, right? mm -hmm. like he was a, he was a Jew, I mean, was born, right. I guess, so I don't know, it seems weird to me. Well, it does, and of course, uh, uh, there, are, there, are, there are many ways and reasons to criticize Bauer in his, uh, in his assessment of the Pauline writings. Uh, my first thought is that he has many other uh, themes uh, to communicate other than anti-Judaizing. Uh, so, so that would not eliminate these other writings. Uh, of course, he actually takes it to uh, an extreme beyond many critics. Uh, many, there are many who deny authorship of the pastorals, uh, uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Uh, but here he's, he's, he's really denying Pauline authorship of, of most of the Pauline corpus. So he really goes beyond. Um, and then I, I would suspect that he looked at the Gospel of John and assumed that it was written uh, well into the second century. And so uh, that, would, that would mean that whoever wrote the Gospel of John had no connection to, to Jesus, uh, was not an eyewitness of those events. And certainly, we see these ideas uh, abounding today in biblical criticism. Lawrence? Like, uh, to, to, haven't we found evidence of, of the 
Gospel of John that puts it well before the second century. So like if we had, uh, I can't remember the manuscript, it's like P75. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if, if, if there was, if we had P75, mm -hmm. knowledge of P75 during this guy's lifetime, then his, his whole argument about John being historically worthless, I mean, like, I mean, his argument of John being so late would be... Right. Well, uh, now, P75, um, if that's the correct number, I'm not uh, sure, I but I think, it's, I think it's, it's dated 120. Anyone uh, remember the dates? That's, that's, well, we all just go down the hall and find <laughs> Dr. Warren. But, uh, um, uh, of course, uh, it may not have been discovered at the time of, of, of Bauer. I don't, I don't know. So, so that would certainly, this later evidence would, would refute him at that point. But there's still... Uh, there's still those who, who deny uh, Johannine authorship of, of the gospel. Yeah. But as always, I mean, anyone who wants to find something wrong with scripture is going to find it, regardless of the overwhelming, or overwhelming amount of evidence that just proves that it is mm -hmm. historically accurate. So, I mean, um, it doesn't really matter if, if, if there is abounding evidence, if they want to find that it is mm -hmm. not historically accurate or reliable, then they're going in their minds to find it, and many people won't believe it. Right. Okay. Well, um, uh, we certainly uh, would, would want to debate Bauer uh, and others that are critics of the authenticity of the scripture. Uh, for our purposes, we need to just be aware that it is in the 19th century that we see the development of biblical criticism as a discipline and it certainly has tremendous impact on religion. We're going to find uh, when we, uh, next week, when we look at the uh, modernist fundamentalist conflict in America, we're going to find that the two, uh, the two main um, opponents of Christianity are going to be the, the, uh, the, the Darwinism and biblical criticism. Those are going to be the two uh, issues that, uh, that Christianity feels most threatened by, or at least fundamentalist Christianity feels most threatened by. Now, in terms of uh, biblical criticism, probably the uh, best known uh, contributor, whoops, I didn't mean to do that, is, um, is Bellhausen. Uh, Julius Bellhausen uh, taught that the Old Testament Pentateuch was an evolutionary composite of four Hebrew traditions known as the JEDP theory. All right, how many of y'all have heard of this? This is, I mean, I, uh, uh, this is the idea that, uh, that of course, the, the traditional uh, view is that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. But uh, Bellhausen, uh, examining those five books, uh, found that there were four different uh, document documents that, uh, that were used as resources by someone who composed it later, like even after the exile. And these, uh, these traditions are noted by uh, the use of Yahweh, Jehovah, uh, as, uh, as a name for God, or Elohim as a name for God. Deuteronomy is a separate uh, tradition. And then, the, then those, uh, those, docu those sections of, uh, of the Pentateuch that talk about the, uh, the priests, that comes from a priestly tradition, okay? Um, I can remember uh, when I was doing my master's work and studying at Wayland Baptist University out in Plainview. This is a university uh, sponsored by the Baptist General Convention of Texas, and uh, certainly they are more moderate than New Orleans Baptist Seminary or Southwestern Baptist Seminary or the church that I was attending, for that, for that matter. And I took an Old Testament class. And this, uh, this class focused on uh, the books of Deuteronomy through 2 Kings. And on the first day, uh, the teacher uh, presented the theme of the class. And that was that, uh, that these books were composed after the exile by someone who wanted to um, uh, present the history of Israel with, uh, uh, with a reason for uh, the fall of 
of, of Judah and the exile, uh, namely that uh, what it says in Deuteronomy, that if you uh, obey, you're blessed. If you disobey, you're cursed. And so uh, the, the, the theory was that all of it was composed after the exile, that the, the, the editor or multiple editors actually put words into Moses' mouth and uh, presented uh, David in, in certain ways to, uh, uh, to elevate him as the ideal king. Um, but at any rate, uh, at the end of that day, my, my jaw was resting on my chest. And a couple of my friends who knew what to expect, whereas I didn't, were looking at me and kind of chuckling because they knew that as a, as a conservative that I would, I would be stunned by these, these, these biblical, critical ideas. Okay? Now, I managed to make my way through that class just fine, and the professor, even though she and I disagreed, uh, she gave me the academic freedom uh, to disagree as long as I studied and learned the material that she was presenting. Okay? So I made it through the class just fine. Uh, but nonetheless, that was uh, my initial exposure to biblical criticism. Joey? Why do they study, like, uh, I took a class just like you in Old Testament, and I, I never understood what, I mean, they study their Hebrew and their, you know, their, mm -hmm. their Greek and their Syrian, they spend their whole life, their PhDs and their pretty, you know, universities. What is their motive in life to do mm -hmm. that for? Mm -hmm. Why are they studying that? Well, because... because I'm sorry, go ahead. No? I'm, are you finished with the, the question? The majority of the kids who were taking the class were all Christians. Because mm -hmm. we're interested in the Old right, Testament. Right, right. It's just kind of funny. Where was, where was this class? At LSU. At, L at LSU. I know one guy okay. went off to be a missionary in China and took the class with me. Mm -hmm. We did like you the whole semester. We're like, what about P90? What was that? I'm about to say P90. I'm done. We were doing that the whole semester, just asking legitimate yeah. questions, you know, and bringing light yeah. on there. It's fun. Well, of course, uh, of course, at LSU, that's that's uh, that's relatively understandable. Being a state university, they're going to be approaching uh, religion from a, um, a a a secular rationalistic perspective. Uh, you know, you would much less expect it from a Baptist university where I was attending. But in both cases. They are uh, they're studying uh, they're, they're they're researching their understanding of the truth, whatever it is, wherever it would take them, and uh, this was their this was their philosophy. Now the woman who is teaching this is a genuine Christian, and uh, and I found my professors at at Wayland to be genuine Christians uh, devoted to, uh, uh, to 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 Christ and evangelism in the church, but they did they did approach it from from a modern perspective. And why is the textual criticism of, of the Bible, why isn't it the Confucius and all these other books, why do they spend so much in their mm -hmm. academic departments trying to, you know, yeah. criticize the Bible? Okay, now, of course, textual criticism and biblical higher criticism are two different things. Textual criticism is what uh, Bill Warren and, you know, his department do. Uh, they look, they're looking at the the, the multiplicity of texts to study the variants so that by their study they can better determine what the original manuscript said so that then we can translate that into uh, truth today okay so textual criticism is a you know is a valid enterprise and I don't know that biblical higher criticism is not valid either but uh, it does uh, it does take one in a in a different direction in terms of looking for uh, source materials and and authorship and and when it's critical to the extent of denying the authenticity of the scripture, well, that becomes uh, uh, problematic. And of course, again, um, uh, F. C. Bauer for sure denied the authenticity of our scripture. Now, Bellhausen, at the end of his life, regretted uh, the wide and negative influence that, that, that his theory had on scholars' trust in the veracity of scripture. So I think Bellhausen was not really wanting to uh, undermine the authenticity of scripture. He was simply examining the scripture and discussing uh, what he found. 
And I will tell you that uh, that when uh, just you know I sometimes question why do people spend this much time on these issues. And when I when I, I described my my call to ministry when I was 40 years old and God called me to teach, my first uh, expectation was that I would teach the New Testament and focus on the letters of Paul. That was just my where my passion was in teaching the Bible. But then I took my first church history class at Wayland Baptist University. I just fell in love with church history and moved forward. And I'm glad that I did, and here's why. Uh, when I study the Bible, I want to find out what the Bible says to me, what the Bible says to my students, and how it impacts our life and ministry. Okay? That's what, that, that's what I want to learn from my Bible study. There's a lot involved in Bible study that, that requires original languages and, and knowing the authorship and the date and the context and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, when, you, when you major in biblical studies, well, then you start uh, pursuing a lot of questions that I'm not interested in. And I can remember speaking to the New Testament professor at Wayland Baptist University just ahead of the summer break, and I said, said uh, Dr. Fagan, what are you going to do this summer? And he said, well, I'm going to do research into uh, the who wrote the 21st chapter of John. <laughs> And I thought, well, you know, I can save you a whole lot of time and trouble. <laughs> but uh, I decided then that that uh, that I was better off to study a church history because I really uh, I, I I love to study uh, the Bible, but I, I I do want to study it on a different level than uh, than than questions of authorship. All right, let me just uh, skip to the end of this section and just give you a definition of modernism uh, that's just slightly different from liberalism. It says Christianity can be explained by scientific categories and deals with social and psychological dimensions of the religious belief structures among people. So modernism uh, is looking at religion from a, a, a scientific sociological perspective all right, and is, is removed from uh, the, the spiritual aspect and would deny uh, supernatural revelation uh, as, uh, as, as, as God's revealed truth to humanity. All right, and so this is what's developing in the 19th century that still has an impact on uh, religion today. Any other questions about, about these issues we've raised so far? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's take a break. All right, let's go ahead and, uh, and return our attention to um, modern European Christianity, moving out of uh, the extreme liberalism into some individuals that, uh, that we may not agree totally with, but uh, do have a, a, uh, a very distinct and pronounced Christian uh, perspective. Uh, one person to, to mention is uh, Soren Kierkegaard, who was a, uh, a, a Danish Lutheran. Uh, he experienced an unhappy childhood. Uh, his, um, his father uh, was, uh, uh, had attempted suicide. His father had felt that he, was, he himself was under a curse, and he kind of passed along this... Um, this unhappiness to his son. His son uh, had uh, had become engaged uh, to uh, a young woman, but then had decided to break off the engagement so that uh, through his suffering he might uh, more effectively engage in Christian thought and uh, Christian ministry. All right, so uh, I certainly do not uh, recommend that uh, any of us uh, follows his, uh, his pattern, but nonetheless, this was his, uh, this was his approach. So he, so he trained for ministry, never took ordination, but he is probably, well, he's best known as the father of Christian existentialism, uh, but I think he's important because of his criticism against uh, the Lutheran state church. Um, 
course, uh, in Denmark, uh, uh, Denmark did, uh, did establish the Lutheran Church as the official uh, church of the state. And uh, Kierkegaard, as uh, being raised in that environment, recognized that the union of church and state had, uh, had uh, just sucked out the vitality of the church and uh, had uh, reduced uh, Christianity simply to citizenship. And he, uh, uh, he, so he was very critical of this kind of, uh, of church. He said that a Christian must be willing to pay the price and not just belong to the church. And he viewed Christendom as the enemy of Christianity. And so he attacked the Danish uh, state church. He viewed it as uh, complacent and formalistic and said that the New Testament instead demands a vital personal commitment of obedience, not the insipid formalism prevalent in uh, Kierkegaard's day. Uh, he called this cheap Christianity. Uh, said if people found out that their Christianity is not true, well, they wouldn't be too disappointed because they were not invested heavily into Christianity. For them, their relationship uh, to the church uh, was simply uh, the equivalent of their uh, citizenship in the state. Making Christianity easy was the crime of Christendom. All right, notice the term Christendom. That, that's, uh, that's a very specific term. It doesn't mean Christianity. It means this union of church and state, this pervasiveness of Christianity in the state. He emphasized risk and adventure of Christianity outside uh, the comfortable systems, and he was particularly uh, an opponent of Hegel's philosophy. Because if you'll remember, Hegel's philosophy called for uh, this, uh, this, this system to work itself out until it reached the absolute idea. Well, according to Hegel, the absolute idea was uh, this, uh, this Christian state. And so uh, uh, Kierkegaard viewed Hegel's philosophy as being uh, the root of the problem uh, in Denmark. Um, uh, said Christianity is rooted in existence, so it is existential. The Christian discovers uh, his or her identity through the pain of human existence. And uh, Kierkegaard is going to be very uh, influential on Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, both whom we will uh, study in just a minute. But obviously this idea of, of cheap uh, Christianity uh, would remind us of, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's uh, uh, cost of discipleship. Okay, So you can see his influence there. Uh, by the way, earlier I was uh, uh, trying to remember a quote, and I couldn't. And then as I was talking to, uh, to Jeremy and Colby, uh, it, it came to mind. Uh, tell me again, Colby, the, the name of this uh, this professor. Did you keep that? Did you keep that up? Okay. Um, Timothy Mark. Timothy Paul Jones. Timothy Paul Jones. Timothy Paul Jones uh, at Southern Seminary. Uh, his DVD series is uh, Christian History Made Easy, and it is a, it's, it's a it's it's a, a very interesting summary. Uh, of uh, Christian history. He just hits really some very high points, but he does a good job of summarizing it. But he said this about liberal Christianity. Liberal Christianity is not a sect of uh, Christianity. It's not an error of Christianity. Uh, it's, it's not a, a heresy of Christianity. It is a, a totally different religion altogether. So for him, liberal Christianity, such as we have been looking at, is not Christianity at all. Okay, if you if you deny the authenticity of the Scripture, if you deny uh, the, uh, the 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 virgin birth of Jesus Christ, if you deny uh, his uh, um, his substitutionary atonement, if you deny his resurrection, uh, if you deny uh, that he is that he's coming again, uh, then then you have denied uh, Christianity. 
All right. So um, uh, that's so that's that's essentially what he was saying about liberal Christianity that I forgot. I, I couldn't couldn't remember a while ago. All right. So let's uh, let's move on to uh, to Karl Barth, uh, who's known as the father of neo orthodoxy. Now, uh, Barth was a Swiss pastor, and he was educated in liberal theology. He pastored for uh, 10 years in Switzerland, and then World War I erupted. And then Barth uh, discovered that liberal theology does not work. All right, so he rejected uh, the, the, the liberalism of his educational background, and he, he was forced to turn back to what he called the strange new world of the Bible. So he set aside all of his theology books and he opened up the Bible and read. In 1919, he published his commentary on Romans, and uh, it has been described as a bomb going off on the playground of the theologians. Because here was a man who had been educated in uh, liberalism and who had the experience of, of pastoring for years. He had the credentials, and yet he had found uh, liberalism to be uh, wanting, to be deficient. And so he, when he produced his commentary, uh, he um, emphasized the sovereignty of God, emphasized God's grace and <coughs> revelation, uh, returning to the understanding of the Bible as the revelation of God. Uh, human finiteness and sinfulness. So he's, he's, he's not optimistic about humanity. He recognizes the sinfulness of humanity. And he says God is wholly other. Uh, he is uh, entirely different. And Christianity is not religion at all. It is God's sovereign and revealing word to which people can only respond. All right, so... Um, certainly a very different approach than what we see from Schleiermacher, uh, F.C. Bauer, uh, uh, Albert Schweitzer, whom we didn't discuss, but he's included in, in the lecture notes. Um, he, uh, um, um, he taught the doctrines of sin and redemption which were ignored by liberal theologians. He, uh, he said that the that reason is worthless one must rely on revelation and faith. Now, um, one, one criticism that uh, conservatives level against Karl Barth and neo-orthodoxy is that, uh, that even though he reacted against liberalism, many feel that he did not go far enough. And when it comes to his doctrine of inspiration, it does seem as if he's teaching that uh, inspiration is a miracle of reading rather than a miracle of writing. In other words, uh, inspiration becomes subjective so that the inspiration comes when one reads and, uh, uh, and is inspired by the Word of God rather than the inspiration being uh, what God... Uh, worked through the writer so that the, the inspiration is not inherent uh, in the writing but becomes a part of the reading of the scripture or the hearing of the scripture. Okay, So it does become subjective and so many are critical of, of Karl Barth. Uh, many times uh, there, there's, uh, there's someone might be uh, criticized as being neo-orthodox and this is what is meant by that. But when you consider uh, what Barth was reacting against Bart uh, really was a radical for his day, and I think he he, uh, he provided a great service uh, to Christianity, especially during this period of time uh, in the uh, in the early 20th century in Europe, which was dominated by uh, liberalism. Now, uh, when we discussed uh, predestination versus free will, I think I gave one slide to Karl Barth. Uh, talking about his doctrine of the elect man. Karl Barth did come out of a reformed uh, tradition so that uh, uh, his, 
for being in Switzerland, uh, he was recognized that it would be dominated by Reformed theology being in the land of Calvin and Zwingli. Uh, but uh, as he understood the doctrine of election, he taught that Christ is the elect man. And uh, uh, all who are in Christ are elect in him. Okay? Which is essentially, uh, I think, is what was taught by uh, Arminius and his followers, this idea of, of uh, that that uh, that election comes through Christ. So so Bart is uh, is uh, of course again remember Jacob Arminius came out of a reformed tradition. So so Bart is kind of returning to to that aspect of election, uh, saying that Jesus is the electing God and the elect man. As the electing God, Jesus elects all of humanity in himself, and thus as the elected man, all who are in Christ are elect in him. Non-believers, um, it is said, have simply not realized or recognized their election in Christ. It is because of this last uh, twist in the idea of election that uh, some uh, critics have charged that Bart's view amounts to an implicit universalism, uh, the idea that uh, that that uh, those who are in Christ are elect, and those who are non-believers uh, simply have not recognized their election in Christ. So this, uh, this is kind of a little twist on, uh, on Karl Barth's uh, soteriology. And uh, it's, um, it's not certain that he would be a universalist, but uh, it, it, those who have studied him have said that he opened himself up to this idea of universalism. Here's a quote from, from Bart, kind of in response to this. The proclamation of the church must make allowance for this freedom of grace. Uh, and what he means by that is, if God acts in freedom, uh, then we can neither deny nor affirm the possibility of universal salvation. If God acts in freedom, God may act freely to elect. All, all persons in Christ. And so Bart says that uh, the church must make allowance for this freedom of grace. Now, uh, he does deny the, uh, the doctrine of um, apokatastasis, which is Origen's idea, if you're familiar with Origen from the early church, Origen uh, taught that, uh, that, that God would redeem ultimately redeem all of humanity, all of creation, including Satan, so that over a period of time, all would have the opportunity for redemption. And so this apokatastasis was Origen's uh, way of teaching universalism, but Karl Barth denies that he was uh, teaching uh, that. He was, he was saying no for a grace which automatically would ultimately have to embrace each and every one would certainly not be free grace. So he's saying, you know, God has the freedom to act, to elect everyone, or not to act in that way. It surely would not be God's grace. <clears throat> but would it be God's free grace if we could absolutely deny that it could do that? Has Christ been sacrificed only for our sins? Has he not been sacrificed for the whole world? Thus the freedom of grace uh, is pre preserved on both these sides. So, in, in, in summarizing uh, Barth's uh, theology, uh, this writer says, For Barth, then, we can neither affirm nor deny the possibility that all will be saved. So what can we do? Barth's answer is clear. We can hope. All right. So according to this, this author, we can hope that all are elected in Christ. Um, that's, uh, that uh, perhaps is, uh, is too optimistic a view of the election. And, but certainly this is the, uh, a view of Bart's teaching on election that has been criticized. So that's another area where Bart has, uh, has been criticized. Um, and then uh, another of his themes was the human infallible character of Scripture. And he taught that the Bible contains God's Word, not that the Bible is God's Word. Okay. So there is, there is another point at which Bart did not go as far as we would have liked for him to go. Do you understand where Bart is? All right, so, so Bart, is, uh, Bart is a friend 
uh, we might want to come alongside him and bring him a little further, but it's too late. Uh, but uh, I think we can appreciate Bart for what he did uh, in, the, uh, in the environment he was in. Now, one thing that is important uh, outside of his theology is, uh, is his, his place in history. All right? you know, he, he began as a pastor in Switzerland, uh, but uh, uh, he did teach for a time in Germany. And during that time, uh, we have the uh, uh, National Socialist Party and Adolf Hitler uh, on the ascent. And uh, they attempted to create the German Christian Church. And so Bart was one who, along with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, founded the Confessing Church to oppose... Uh, this, uh, this German Christian church. 1934, Bart authored the Barman Declaration, which supported the revelation of Jesus Christ against Hitler's propaganda and National Socialism. Because of his uh, uh, participation in the Confessing Church, because of his opposition to Adolf Hitler, uh, the Nazis, and uh, the German uh, church, in 1935, he was fired from his post. Uh, he refused to swear allegiance to Hitler, and so he, he left and became professor at Basel uh, in uh, Switzerland. In 1962, he visited uh, America, where he was put on the cover of Time magazine. There is a story. Uh, we don't know that it is true, but it is a great story, that as he was uh, in America being interviewed, uh, he was asked to summarize his theology. And after giving it a moment's thought, he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. All right? So whether that story is true or not, I think it does uh, uh, speak well of Karl Barth uh, and, his, uh, and his reputation. All right? Karl Barth. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was uh, his younger contemporary um, grew up in a very uh, influential uh, and intellectual family. Uh, they were surprised when he decided to become a theologian. But he had decided that through theology he could have a positive impact on humanity. But it's interesting that not only was he a theologian, but he also was a pastor. And uh, he pastored a number of churches uh, and it's wonderful to, uh, to read about him, uh, especially with children. Uh, and he also became active in the Confessing Church, and uh, particularly uh, in his uh, support of the Jews. <clears throat> now, uh, at one point, Bart traveled to America uh, to study. This was... Um, in 1930, went to America and he uh, studied at Union Seminary in uh, New York City. And uh, very nearby uh, Union uh, Seminary was the Riverside Church, which is pastored by um, Harry Emerson Fosdick. He was the most noted liberal uh, preacher of his day, uh, quite well known. And uh, the church had been built by John D. Rockefeller and with no expense spared. And uh, uh, Bonhoeffer attended the church often, um, as well as other American churches. That, uh, most of them were under the sway of liberalism. And as he heard uh, the, uh, these preachers, this is what he said. I have heard only one sermon in which you could hear something like a genuine proclamation. He said, uh, in New York, they preach about virtually everything. Only one thing is not addressed, or is addressed so rarely, that I have as yet been unable to hear it, namely, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The cross, sin and forgiveness, death and life. So, uh, and he goes on to say, what, uh, what stands in place of the Christian method, message? An ethical and social idealism born by a faith in progress that, who knows how, claims the right to call itself Christian. 
and in the place of the church as the congregation of believers in Christ, there stands the church as a social corporation. This is Bonhoeffer's criticism of the American church. Now, there was one place where Bonhoeffer heard the gospel preached. You know where that was? The African American churches. The African American churches, yes. Right on. Right on. The Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem is one of the oldest Baptist churches, uh, African American Baptist churches uh, in America. Uh, there in the socially downtrodden African American community, Bonhoeffer would finally hear the gospel preached and see its power manifested. The preacher was a powerful figure named Dr. Adam Clayton Powell, Sr. Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. was the first black congressman from New York City. By this time, the Abyssinian Baptist Church boasted 14,000 members and was arguably the largest Protestant church of any kind in the whole United States. Powell combined the fire of a revivalist preacher with great intellect and social vision. He was active in combating racism and minced no words about the saving power of Jesus Christ. All right. Um, uh, this is from a, a letter saying that the, the one sermon that, uh, that uh, he has heard that was uh, delivered by was that was that had the proclamation was delivered by a Negro. Indeed, in general, I'm increasingly discovering greater religious power and originality in Negroes. He said, and this is uh, this is not his words, but this is a summary of his words. Uh, the only real piety and power that he had seen in the American church seemed to be in the churches where there was a present reality and a past history of suffering. Let me repeat that, because we are entering a period in American history when we need to understand that the only real <coughs> piety and power that he had seen in the American church seemed to be in the churches where there were a present reality and a past history of suffering. Okay, Real suffering is going to bring power to the American church. And so, brothers, uh, I believe we're entering into a period where we're going to find that Christians are going to suffer on one level or another in a way that we have never seen in America. All right? Um, if you look at, uh, I, I don't know if I've, I've shared this before, but if you look at, uh, at Luke 6.22 in the New International Version, it's Jesus said, Blessed are those who hate, exclude, insult, and reject you. H-E-I-R. So those who suffer are heirs. You look at uh, Romans 8, 16 and 17. Uh, you know, Paul says that, that uh, you are uh, sons of God, uh, you are uh, fellow heirs with Christ, if you suffer with him in order that you may uh, be glorified with him. All right, so those of us who experience that kind of suffering, and, and suffering is not uh, limited to martyrdom. It's not limited to uh, imprisonment. Uh, it can be as broad as hatred, exclusion, insult, and rejection. But uh, as, we, as we enter into a period where we face this, uh, we, we need not to fear, but we need to be aware that God can bring out of that suffering the real power of the gospel. And certainly that's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, teaches us from his experience in America in the early 1930s. By the way, this comes from uh, uh, the, uh, the biography, uh, Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy, by Eric Metaxas. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. It has been criticized by some by presenting uh, Bonhoeffer as, uh, uh, as an American evangelical, uh, and so they, they take offense at that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, um, uh, I found it to be 
uh, an inspiring biography of this man. All right. Well, let's uh, let's uh, let's see what happened to uh, to Bonhoeffer uh, later. Uh, he returned to Germany, and uh, there he, along with Bart, uh, founded the Confessing Church. He began to teach in uh, an underground seminary because the seminaries uh, either had to be associated with the National Church or they were uh, they were outlawed. And so he taught uh, in a seminary related to the Confessing Church. It was underground. They moved around uh, uh, until finally they were uh, disbanded. Uh, in 1939, he traveled again to the U.S. Uh, for a lecture tour. Uh, um, uh, it was a great effort to, uh, to get him uh, a position at, uh, at Union Seminary, an opportunity for him to come and study and teach. Uh, but once he arrived in the United States, he realized that he had made a mistake. And he decided that he uh, must return to Germany. If he did not return to, uh, to Germany to suffer with his people, then he would have no right to return to Germany after uh, uh, the end of the war uh, and, and, to, and to try to teach and minister to them. He had to go back to Germany and suffer with them. So he did return. He became involved in a conspiracy to assassinate Hitler. How many of y'all have seen the movie Valkyrie? All right, this is a movie based on uh, uh, the group that, uh, that, that Bonhoeffer was a part of. And uh, he was a part of this, uh, this conspiracy to assassinate Hitler. Bonhoeffer is not a character in the film because the events took place after Bonhoeffer was already imprisoned. And so he was out of the action, but he was part of uh, that, uh, that conspiracy. Well, here is a question I'm going to uh, throw out for our discussion. How could a pacifist, how could a Christian ethicist, how could someone who uh, holds to the truth of uh, the commandment, thou shalt not kill, how can such a person become involved in a plot to murder a man? Thomas? All right, to preserve life. Okay, it's a good point. Anybody want to expand on that? Okay. Well, Thomas has has has, has summed summed it up uh, accurately. Bonhoeffer considers himself guilty of sin to be part of this plot. He considered it a sin to uh, to kill uh, Adolf Hitler. But anyone who tolerated or ignored Hitler was guilty of mass murder. And so to, to kill Hitler was less of a sin than to stand by and allow him to, uh, to, uh, to kill millions. And so he became involved uh, in this plot. Well, in 1943, uh, his, his name, uh, he was arrested uh, on suspicion. Then later on, his name was found on a list of, of conspirators. Uh, April 9, 1945, uh, he was hung. Uh, they, uh, they, they took him out, they stripped him naked, uh, and they hung him. Three weeks later, Hitler committed suicide. And then less than two months later, the, the war in Europe was over. Uh, he left behind a fiance, Maria, uh, but uh, um, he's, um, uh, he's uh, you know, the many times we, there are questions whether we should consider Dietrich Bonhoeffer a Christian martyr. Or was he instead a political subversive? Um, well, um, I'm, I'm probably going to put him in the list of Christian martyrs. In fact, I'm tasked with writing an article for the Louisiana Baptist Message on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and uh, and will present him, uh, you know, in that category. It's really as a I've been writing a, a series about martyrs throughout history, starting in the early church and then dealing with the Anabaptists, and now I'm about to move into of the 20th century, but uh, but at any rate, Bonhoeffer um, was uh, was executed uh, because of his involvement 
to end the mass murder uh, in Germany. Well, there's a, a number of, of writings that he leaves behind. The Cost of Discipleship, Cheap Grace versus Costly Grace. Again, you see, uh, see the, the influence uh, from, from Kierkegaard. Life Together is the story of this illegal seminary of the Confessing Church. It's going to be interesting for me uh, because, uh, as I say, a year from now, I'm going to be in China uh, essentially teaching in a seminary much like this a seminary that is illegal. Uh, and I don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, you know, ask me when I come back. Uh, but it's not going to be quite as dangerous, I don't think, as, uh, as what uh, Bonhoeffer went through uh, in Germany. But nonetheless, that's the, the story. Uh, he wrote a book on ethics that was incomplete. Um, uh, he declared the church guilty of the deaths of the weakest and most defenseless brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Of course, he's talking about the, uh, the, uh, the, the state church in Germany uh, who acted uh, in complete uh, 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 alliance with and allegiance to Adolf Hitler. All right? They were just seduced by the power of, uh, of Adolf Hitler. And then we have uh, letters and papers uh, from prison. That last one, you've got sections on marriage. It's a man that's never been married. He's got some huge insights into what marriage is all about. Okay. Very good. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. All right. So those who want some marriage counsel, check out the letters and papers from prison. I actually just bought a copy of that at Half Price Books when I was uh, when I was um, um, in Texas. Any other questions or comments about Bonhoeffer? Okay. Fascinating uh, uh, figure. Well, um, let's move on and talk about evangelical movements in England. Uh, it's, uh, we kind of have to move to England to really find um, uh, movements that are uh, evangelical in, in the way that we would uh, consider evangelical Christianity. Um, in the, the, the Clapham Parish, there was a group that uh, worshipped together and emphasized the repeal of slavery, missionary work, Bible printing and distribution, Sunday school, and moral reform. Uh, this, uh, the Clapham sect, sounds very much like uh, the, the, the work of the societies in America following uh, the Second Great Awakening. And one of their uh, most famous adherents uh, was William Wilberforce, who was the leader of the abolition movement uh, used his political influence to enact welfare and prison reform, but again, his most famous work was the abolition of slavery uh, in Britain. How many of y'all have seen the movie Amazing Grace? For those who haven't, uh, need to. Uh, Amazing Grace. Uh, I can't pronounce the name of the actor who portrays William Wilberforce, but he's the same guy that plays Mr. Fantastic in the Fantastic Four. It's, uh, uh, don't, don't judge him on uh, Fantastic Four, go ahead and, and, uh, uh, and, see, uh, and see this movie. Uh, the, the, the reason that the, that the story is called Amazing Grace is that uh, William Wilberforce was much influenced by John Newton, the author of the hymn Amazing Grace. John Newton, as you know, uh, uh, had been uh, a, uh, a ship captain of a slave trading vessel. And uh, uh, it was um, out, of, out of this miserable existence, this sinful uh, existence of, of abuse of slaves, he came out of that to realize God's amazing grace. When he talks about being a wretch. He, he felt his wretchedness. But John Newton uh, had an influence on, on Wilberforce. He was already in the parliament. He already was one of the leading political figures uh, of his day. He was uh, best friends with William Pitt, who went on to become the Prime Minister of England. Uh, and when Wilberforce became a Christian, he considered leaving Parliament uh, to go into the ministry. But John Newton uh, encouraged him to stay where he was because he could do uh, great things for the cause of Christ in his position on Parliament, and certainly uh, he did. So uh, he certainly is worth more than one slide in my lecture, but nonetheless, 
we are moving on with the encouragement for you to see the movie and you'll learn a lot more about him. Well, Salvation Army, uh, again, a, 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 a production of the 19th century founded by William and Catherine Booth. Um, William was converted in the Methodist New Connection Church. New Connection means that uh, they came out of liberalism uh, uh, to reclaim the uh, evangelical uh, uh, ministry and, and fervor and passion of John Wesley. Uh, and uh, uh, he resigned the church because the, the church tried to restrict his work to one parish. And you may remember that this was the practice uh, in England that, uh, that uh, the pastor was assigned to the parish and uh, that, was, that was the limit of his, of, the, of, of, uh, of his ministry. He rejected that. John Wesley had done it before uh, as, as, a, um, as a reaction against the, the Church of England which required him to be in one parish. He said, the world is my parish. Well, uh, uh, William Booth felt the same way. And so he and his wife, Catherine, began to conduct an itinerant evangelistic ministry. Uh, in 1865, he opened the Christian Mission in London in 1878. Uh, uh, in an inspired move, he renamed his mission the Salvation Army. And uh, that, uh, that name really uh, captured everyone's imagination and uh, inspired him to... to create many uh, innovations, uh, have the orders and regulations, the Salvation Army Band, all right, which uh, would, uh, would entertain and attract attention uh, for the, the preaching, began to wear uniforms. Uh, in 1886, <coughs> he toured America. So the Salvation Army went from England to America and uh, began to, uh, to offer food and shelter and uh, uh, doing, uh, providing an outreach through uh, ministries like that. In 1912, William died. By that time, there were 16,000 officers. Uh, by 1989, which is the last uh, statistics available to me when I created this slide, there were over 25,000 officers, 14,000 core worldwide. So a worldwide uh, ministry, uh, the Salvation Army. Um, the Plymouth Brethren in 1830 um, John Nelson Darby joined the Plymouth Brethren and became their leader uh, this was a uh, this was a group that we was it didn't begin uh, it didn't start out to be a denomination it really was, uh, was an attempt to draw from denominations uh, to, uh, to bring about a uh, um, a kind of a spiritual growth, uh, an atmosphere of, of, of Bible study, but it just it became a denomination, combining Calvinism and Pietism and strong <coughs> millennial expectations. The beliefs uh, were uh, uh, communion every Sunday, uh, priesthood of the believers who exercise spiritual gifts, um, autonomy of the local church, biblical authority, missions and evangelism, but the key, what really sets them apart and makes them important is dispensational, premillennial eschatology. John Nelson Darby <coughs> is credited with introducing the concept of the rapture, which had not been taught before. Does that surprise you? The rapture is really a recent concept, but one that has certainly captured the, uh, the imagination of, uh, of, of most Christians. Certainly, um, uh, in, the, in, in, my, in my day, uh, Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, was, uh, was a great communicator, uh, and uh, more recently, um, LaHaye and Jenkins, the Left Behind series made it very popular, but it really originated uh, in the um, um, 1830s with, uh, with John Nelson Darby. All right, we're going to keep moving. The next evangelical we're going to look at is uh, C.H. Spurgeon, the 
foremost Baptist preacher of his age. Um, how many of y'all have, have heard his testimony or read it? Or read it, his conversion. All right, a few of you have. If you've been in Baptist heritage, you've certainly uh, heard it. But it's interesting that um, um, the, the story of his salvation, he grew up in a, in a, a family of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Puritans, of dissenters, um, but, uh, but not, anyway, they, they were certainly um, baptized infants uh, in, his, in his family, so he's a dissenter, but, but not a Baptist. But uh, he, uh, anyway, this is a quote of his story. He says, I sometimes think I might have been in darkness and despair now had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm one Sunday morning when I was going to a place of worship. When I could go no further, I turned down a court and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel, there might be a dozen or 15 people. The minister did not come that morning. He was uh, snowed in, probably. A poor man, um, a, a lay preacher, uh, went up to the pulpit to preach. He was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had nothing to say. His text was uh, from Isaiah 45, 22, and uh, uh, Spurgeon said that text is, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Uh, he didn't pronounce the words rightly, but that did not matter. There, um, there, and, and, and Spurgeon thought to himself, there's a glimpse of hope for me in the text. And then, uh, and then the preacher began to say, my dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now, uh, does not that take, that doesn't take a deal, a deal of effort. It ain't lifting your feet or your finger. It is just look. Well, uh, any man can look. A child can look. This is what the text says. It says, look unto me. Um, and then he, then he, Spurgeon goes on, and then he says uh, uh, that the, the, the lake preacher looked around, and he could tell that Spurgeon was a, was a visitor and uh, was a stranger. And he said, young man, you look very miserable. And Spurgeon said, well, I did. Uh, but I did not have, been a, I was not accustomed to having remarks made on my personal appearance from the pulpit. Um, however, it was a good blow struck. He continued, and you will always be miserable miserable in life and miserable in death if you do not obey my text. But if you obey now this moment, you will be saved. Then he shouted, as only a primitive Methodist can. <laughs> Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Young man, look. Look to Jesus Christ. Look now. Spurgeon said, well, I, uh, I, 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 could, I could do nothing but look. And at that moment, I saw the sun. I could have risen that moment and sung were the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood of Christ. So anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, Spurgeon's testimony of how he got saved because he got, at, got in a snowstorm and he ended up hearing a lay preacher uh, doing the best he could. He was, he was where he was supposed to be at that time and with whatever gifts and especially the text that God had given him, he was able to preach a message that brought about the salvation of uh, a man who then went on to be uh, the Prince of Preachers. 1861, he built the, the Metropol Metropolitan Tabernacle of London. It's uh, been, been described as uh, one of the earliest megachurches uh, in history. He went on to form Spurgeon College. He was a strong Calvinist, um, although uh, one, of his, uh, one of his prayers was uh, Lord, hasten to bring in all thine elect, and then elect some more. All right. So he's a Calvinist, but certainly a, a, uh, a an evangelistic uh, Calvinist. Um, he uh, he smoked cigars. He said that, that he would smoke a cigar to the glory of God after Sunday <laughs> evening church. And he also was an advocate of of growing a beard. He called that a manly, spiritual thing to do to grow a beard. Uh, I've looked that up, and actually in the context he's talking about uh, uh, protecting oneself from the cold. Uh, but, none, but as beards are becoming uh, popular <coughs> among certain seminarians, he, uh, uh, he's certainly uh, uh, being cited as an excuse for, for growing beards. 
Oh, I forgot. To, I did want to say one more thing about his smoking cigars. Uh, there was uh, one time I was walking around campus. I do this, you know, every morning and every night. Yeah, and one evening uh, early in my time here, I was walking to campus and I uh, came past uh, uh, the, the Lipsy dorm. And I saw a circle of, uh, of, of young men over in front of the dorm. And I, I recognized a couple of them. So I went over to say hello. And as I looked around, I noticed one of them was uh, smoking a pipe. I said, I said oh, so I said, that thought that was interesting. And I looked at the next one, he was smoking a cigar. And I said, oh, you're smoking a cigar to the glory of God, uh, following C.H. Uh, Spurgeon's advice. And then as I kept looking around, I realized there were about 10 guys there, and every one of them was smoking either a pipe or a cigar. Uh, and I said, is there no tobacco policy here at the seminary? <laughs> He said, no, Dr. Butler. Well, y'all enjoy. So I went on. I went, went back to the house, and I looked up the, uh, the, uh, the seminary handbook. And you know what? There is no policy that prohibits smoking on campus. You cannot smoke inside the buildings, but it's certainly permissible to smoke outside the buildings. And, and this was kind of a habit of, of these uh, Lipsy guys. And uh, uh, so they did that often, and and uh, and God bless them. I uh, I enjoyed every every one of them, and and um, so um, wish them the best. Well, the uh, toward the end of Spurgeon's life, he got involved in the downgrade controversy, and as liberalism moved from Europe to England, uh, the idea of Darwinism, this idea of biblical <coughs> higher criticism it began to uh, have an impact on the preaching, even in the Baptist churches in England. And so Spurgeon, uh, writing in his, uh, his church newsletter, uh, the, um, the Sword and Trowel, uh, he uh, began to saying that, that the church was on a downgrade uh, with liberalism. And um, then, but, but he found that he did not receive any support from others in the, uh, the Baptist Association. He was so discouraged. Um, but they were, they were demanding that he name names. If, if, he was, if he was concerned about liberalism in the pulpits, then name the names. Well, he could not because he had been given this information by the president of the Baptist Association, and the president had given him that information on... Uh, uh, with a demand of, of confidentiality. So, um, anyway, uh, eventually it led to the split in the Baptist Union, and um, uh, that was um, Spurgeon suffered from depression and, and died uh, soon after that. But at any rate, Spurgeon uh, should be remembered not only as, a, as, as one of the great preachers of all time, uh, but as, as, uh, as one who was committed to uh, theological uh, conservatism in the face of liberalism. All right, the next um, person we're going to look at is uh, C.S. Lewis, Clive Staples Lewis. Uh, and uh, again, we uh, were pro privileged to have an expert in our midst. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mark Caruso to uh, take about uh, uh, you know eight to ten minutes or so um, to, uh, to talk to us about uh, C.S. Lewis, the subject of his uh, research paper. So, Mark? Um, I wouldn't go as far as saying a resident uh, knowledgeable guy, but um, Lewis, as we all know, he started out with a, it was more of a bland Christianity in his upbringing. Um, it was taught, but we can compare it mostly to uh, the Christer families that we're familiar with, those who attend church at Christmas and Easter. Um, but when his mother passed away, uh, when he was nine, um, he really saw that there was tr no true goodness in God. Uh, that pretty much came to the core of his belief for a long time. He kind of lost all the joy from his childhood. And it only progressed as he began to study with um, Kirk Patrick, uh, one of, actually his father's tutor, when his father was uh, Lewis's age. Um, Kirkpatrick was an atheist, uh, but he didn't feed uh, that atheism in Lewis. He kind of never talked about that in his studies or anything. It had come across in small discussions. Um, but Lewis himself would actually 
find ammo and find fuel in his, uh, his reading. Uh, he was pretty much a very much rationalist. He was an idealist when it came to atheism. Um, he moved into Oxford, uh, and because of his studies from Kirkpatrick and his family always uh, being pretty much booky people, uh, always having access to literature, um, really excelled in literature, specifically English literature. Um, called off the World War uh, I, uh, was wounded, lost his, one of his best friends, came back, took care of his friend's mother. But it was really to the point after um, graduating and taking the position um, at Oxford is where he began to realize that his favorite writers always had some semblance of God, some reference to God in their writings. And he began to realize that being an atheist, you have to be careful what you read and where you go and what you look, because God always seems to unscrupulously provide ways to him, uh, be it a Bible that's laid open, be it a favorite author or whatnot. Um, so he began to really see that God was there. Um, he didn't really truly convert to Christianity until later, but he became a very cautious theist. Um, it was after his time uh, meeting with Tolkien um, that he began to realize there was actually a true change. Uh, it was one night after talking to about 3 to 4 a.m. with Tolkien that he began to realize that, hey, there's more to just God. There's actually a relationship with Christ. And he was able to rediscover joy uh, that was missing in his entire life. And so from that point on, um, he became a member of the Church of England. He accepted Christ as um, Lord of his life from there. But where it really progressed was that he saw a need for the lost uh, to receive uh, access to, not to scripture, but in literature. And um, he wrote the Narnia series, uh, and completed it later on in his life, which wasn't uh, attributed to Animal Land, which he was writing uh, and drawing at such an early age. Uh, so there really was no crossover there. He used it to help supplement, but there was no connection. Um, the Space Trilogy also was to show the inlays of a new Eden, uh, true love, agape love. Um, and then he used mere Christianity, the screw tape letters, um, problems with pain, the great divorce, to reach out to a lost world. But not just the lost world, but to also give believers a, a deeper insight to where faith can go. He was also cautious to say that as he is developing his own theology, that he might be wrong at times in certain areas, and this is how it's applicable to his life, and not necessarily take it tit for tat as he goes on. Um, but as we know, it's, I mean, when I first read Mere Christianity 10, 15 years ago, I had to take it in pieces and, you know, just kind of chew through it. Um, and the same thing with the screw tape letters and the great divorce, but uh, being a fiction guy myself, I love uh, the Space Trilogy. Can you tell us about his marriage to Joy Gresham? Um, no, I'm stuck in my hand without okay. back in my paper. Okay, all right. Uh, there, there's an interesting love story uh, in, in Lewis's life, and he certainly was uh, not uh, not someone who would uh, <coughs> who, who would consider a romantic or even the, the subject of a, of a romantic uh, relationship. But uh, he... Um, after he was began writing, particularly after the success of of the uh, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, he <coughs> get a, received a lot of correspondence from admirers around the world, and he uh, uh, made a sincere effort to respond uh, to as many as he could. And one of his uh, his admirers was uh, Joy Gresham, who was a woman from America, lived in New York City. Uh, two sons, uh, uh, married at the time, and uh, she, uh, she actually, they corresponded, and she came to, uh, to England to meet C.S. Lewis, and they began a friendship. She then returned to America, and uh, there uh, she found that her, uh, in her absence, her husband had not only taken up uh, a mistress, but had moved her into the house. And so uh, Joy uh, uh, had to uh, get a divorce, 
I was really struggling to uh, to um, to to really find uh, a direction for her life, and so she returned to England uh, and uh, lived in London for a while, and then uh, uh, C.S. Lewis arranged for her to rent a house uh, in the neighborhood, and uh, uh, it, it came to a point where Joy's uh, visa was about to expire, and Britain would not allow her to remain. Uh, would not renew her visa. So she would not be able to remain unless she married a British citizen. And so uh, she approached uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, by the way, he was always called Jack by his friends. She said, Jack, uh, would you marry me so that I can remain in England? So they, they, they married as a matter of convenience. Uh, they did not live together. Uh, they uh, um, did not consummate the marriage. Uh, at that time, but uh, continued to uh, to see each other often, uh, many times a week. They would they would spend time together, um, and then uh, it came about that uh, Joy contracted bone cancer, and during her suffering with bone cancer, uh, C.S. Lewis fell in love with her and uh, asked her to marry him. She said, "Jack, we're already married." And, and he said, we're married in the eyes of the state. I want to be married in the eyes of God. And so he had an, an Anglican priest perform the wedding ceremony there uh, in uh, the hospital. And, uh, and they, then they kissed for the first time. And, uh, uh, and, and, and they truly fell in love. And then uh, during a, uh, a period of remission, uh, Jack and Joy were able to travel. They even went to Greece. Uh, but uh, he, uh, it was the, the high point of his life. They had three years of, of marriage together until Joy's cancer returned uh, and she died. And, of course, that <coughs> had, a, had a tremendous impact on his life, as you can imagine. Uh, but uh, still, during that time, he maintained uh, his faith. Well, uh, we know that uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were close friends. They met often at the Eagle and Child with, uh, with a group they called the Inklings. They would uh, read uh, manuscripts to each other uh, in the rabbit room. They discussed writings such as the Chronicles of Narnia and the Ring Trilogy. And it was J.R.R. Tolkien who had a tremendous influence on uh, uh, Lewis's coming uh, to faith in Christ. And uh, Mark has mentioned a number of, uh, uh, of his writings, and certainly the variety alone is a testimony to his literary genius, uh, uh, children's stories that are for far more than just children, the space trilogy of science fiction, uh, problem of pain and mere Christianity, apologetical writings, screw tape letters and great divorce, uh, 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 satires, and then he was uh, uh, certainly well known through his uh, uh, radio talks on BBC. How many of y'all have read at least one book? by C.S. Lewis. Okay, good. Anyone who is not needs to make that a goal of reading at least one book. Start with The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. <coughs> if you have children, if you have children, read uh, the Narnia series to them. I started reading to my boys when they were five and two, and I started reading the, through the Chronicles of Narnia. And that gave us a lifetime of reading uh, reading chapter stories every night for years and years and years. Seven years we did that. Finally, when the boys were 12 and 9, we spent a year working our way through uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. But if you have children, uh, I recommend reading to them. And a good place to start is with the Narnia series. All right, we, it is time uh, for, uh, for me to uh, close the lecture.